Happy Easter, friends. Grace and peace be with each and every one of you. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. On Easter Sunday, we celebrate the gift of resurrection and new life, the forgiveness of sins and the opportunity to know that we are loved and can live as new people. So I'm really glad you could join us for worship today. I'm here in the sanctuary. The flowers are beautiful. I wish you could be here with me to celebrate, but I'm glad you're where you are and joining us for this worship celebration. We certainly want to thank the people who helped with the flowers, the decorations. We have some awesome music for you today. Thank you musicians, thank you technical people who made this all happen. And thanks be to God for the gift of life, for being here together. Today we're celebrating communion because it's the first Sunday of the month and we celebrate a joyful resurrection feast on this day. So I hope you have some bread or some juice or something close to that so you can enjoy this feast with us. We're not together in person physically, but we're together in spirit to celebrate God's persistent and strong love for us and for the world. Happy Easter. Let us worship God together. Easter day. We acknowledge and confess to the ways that we so often lose sight of your redeeming love, your stirring spirit, your prompting presence. We confess, God, that when we hope that you make all things new, we are sometimes wary of being made new too. We confess to when we would rather live comfortably rather than courageously, begrudgingly rather than boldly, or hollow rather than 
whole. And we remember that we are beloved and forgiven and that you do indeed make all things, even us, new. Amen. And so friends, we ask ourselves as forgiven people and as loved people, how shall we live? Our faith can guide our steps. And so each month we read the Ten Commandments, reminding ourselves of how we can live according to God's law. We will have no other gods but God. We will not worship idols or any false god. We shall keep God's name holy. We will honor the Sabbath as a day of holy rest. We will honor our fathers and our mothers. We will not kill. We will not commit adultery. We will not steal. We will not bear false witness against our neighbors and we will not covet our neighbors' things. And we remember the greatest commandment Jesus gave us, that we will love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we will love our neighbors as ourselves. May it be so. Friends, we can extend that love this day and every day. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please share signs of peace. Happy Easter, everybody. Did you look for Easter eggs this morning? Did you have fun looking for them and then finding them? I like finding seashells. Sometimes they're hard to find on the beach, but when I find one, I get excited, almost like it's finding an Easter egg. Here, let me show you some of the shells I have in my collection. I like how different all the shells are. There are different colors. Some are big, some are small. Some have really neat designs and whorls. But some of my very favorite shells are the ones that look like their names. Which of these shells do you think are called shark eyes? Good guess. Which of these look like turkey wing shells? Yes. Can you find the checkerboard clams? Good job. And how about my favorites called cat's paws? You got it. But some of the shells in my collection aren't so fun looking. Don't these look kind of blah? They don't look like there's going to be anything good or special about them. I wonder if that's just kind of how Mary Magdalene and the other women felt when they went to go visit Jesus after he had died on the cross. They weren't expecting anything good to happen. Certainly nothing special. Yeah, more than boring, it was terrible, it was sad. But when they got there, there was an angel dressed in white and Jesus' body wasn't there. The angel said, he is risen, Jesus is alive. And that's why we celebrate Easter, because Jesus is alive. He's not on earth anymore, so we can't see him, but Jesus is still alive, caring for you and for all of us. So what do these blah shells have to do with Easter? These shells remind me that even if things look bad, there might be something good and special that could happen. For example, if you turn this spiny white and brown shell over, you'll see a surprise, a deep, beautiful purple. This brown lump that looks like mud has a secret pocket. It's called a slipper shell. Turn this plain one over and there's bright yellow. It's called a buttercup. And lastly, this one that feels prickly is called a prickly cockle shell. When you turn it over, it's like a sunrise. You see orange and purple. You may have some of these shells at home if you came to drive through in donuts last weekend. If you don't and you'd like some, just ask Donna. Remember, when you see something blah, like a plain shell, or things in your life seem blah, or even terrible, like with Mary Magdalene, something good and special could happen. We might not know what will happen, but we need to hold on to hope. Wonderful things can come out of the plainest of shells and the hardest of times. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for beautiful shells and even the plain ugly ones that can hold surprises. And thank you most of all, Lord, 
for the gift of your son, Jesus, who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Easter is a day of joy and celebration for us. But that first Easter was not a time of celebration. It was isolation, uncertainty, and fear. There were no flowers, no trumpets, no candy at the tomb 2,000 years ago. Jesus was dead. He had been killed as an enemy of the state. He had come with a message of good news, proclaiming the kingdom of God and blessings for the poor, for the outcasts, for the forgotten. He called people to live in new ways, to love one another, to love even their enemies. He called people to turn away from hypocrisy and greed and selfishness and worship only God and God's love and God's rule. He had special words for the lost and the least and the last, the people who had been forgotten by so many others. For these and other reasons, Jesus became an enemy of the political, religious, and economic establishment. And as a result, he was put to death on a cross. As the authorities closed in, most of Jesus' followers got scared and ran away. Just a few of them were there when he died on the cross. Three of them went to visit the tomb where he had been laid. They went with spices for burial. They were expecting nothing more than a dead body. Now, as you may know, we have four Gospels in our Christian Bible. Matthew, Luke, and John all have accounts of the resurrected Jesus, speaking with the disciples, teaching them, sharing meals with them, offering peace with them, encouraging them for the journey ahead. Those Gospels are filled with resurrection good news. But Mark's gospel is different. There's no resurrected Jesus present. The gospel ends with confusion and fear as these women come to the tomb and they see that it's empty. The last word in most English Bibles is afraid. What a way to end a gospel with this word fear. Well, perhaps the intent is to invite us to be present at that empty tomb, to recognize the possibility of something new happening, to be there with that isolation, uncertainty, and fear, and then to step into the story and continue the story. Listen now for God's word according to Mark's gospel, the very final words of that gospel. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? 
when they looked up. They saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Thanks be to God for the words of Scripture. The women at the tomb felt isolation, uncertainty, and fear. These are things that we've been feeling over this past year. For most of us, this past year was the worst one of our lives. COVID has taken too many lives and caused too much devastation, causing economic and political chaos. And in addition to the devastation of COVID, we face the ongoing tragic reality of racism. Reminded again this week with the trial involving the death of George Floyd and with renewed attacks on Asian Americans in our country. We're in the midst of an environmental crisis with melting ice caps, raging wildfires, extreme temperatures, extreme weather with tornadoes and hurricanes going, all of which makes us wonder about the future of our planet. And we're divided as we've never been before, politically, socially, economically, with too many people being led astray by rumors and outright lies and misinformation with the gap growing between rich and poor, all of these things making it very hard for anyone to work together for the common good. So we're in a challenging time right now and making all of these things, making them harder is the isolation we've had to experience because of COVID over this past year. We've had to keep our distance from one another. We miss our loved ones, we miss handshakes, and hugs. We miss getting together and having a cup of coffee and talking about the weather, talking about sports. We miss restaurants and movies. We miss, we miss going to church. We miss being together in person. We've done the best that we could with masks and distancing and with new technology, staying in touch with one another. I'm really impressed with the way people have taken to that new technology. I'm grateful for creative and persistent ways we found to try to stay connected with one another. And now, finally, finally, with the help of a vaccine, we can start slowly and carefully and gradually reconnecting with one another we are slowly and gradually moving from fear to hope, just like we see in our gospel reading for today. Most of the disciples had scattered when Jesus was arrested. The remaining women were weary and afraid. They go to anoint the body, unsure of what they would find. At the tomb, the stones rolled back. There's this young man in a white robe, this angelic figure who is there. And he invites them to not be alarmed, but to consider the possibility that the story isn't over yet. The angelic figure essentially tells them, despite how bad things look right now, don't be afraid. Jesus isn't here, but he will be with you. He'll be with you in Galilee, the place where you live, where you work, where you live your daily routines. He'll be there with you. Go and find his disciples. Go and find the others and tell them the story isn't over. This is the good news at a time of bad news. Now, if you got an A plus in your Bible study class, you'll know that Mark's gospel in particular accents the phrase good news. The very first words of the gospel are the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The, the gospel is all about the good news, but it ends in such a sad and depressing way with this bad news of Jesus' death and the women being afraid. But the thing is, I th really think it's an unfinished story, inviting us into it. The angel's telling the women, the story isn't over. You'll see Jesus in the days and weeks and years ahead. 
The story doesn't end with suffering, isolation, and death. There's more to the story. There's always more. Presbyterian author Frederick Beekner puts it well, saying, the worst isn't the last thing about the world. It's the next to last thing. The last is always best. The worst thing isn't the last thing. That gives us hope to keep going, to find something better. In a time of fear, Easter is a message of hope. In a time of despair, Easter is good news. In a time of isolation, Easter is a call for us to get together and to keep moving forward, to continue the journey. In a very different context, Winston Churchill essentially said the same thing, famously saying, if you're going through hell, keep going. The good news of Easter is that God isn't finished with us. God isn't finished with the world. We need to remember that after the crucifixion, resurrection comes. Death leads to new life somehow in some way. New life slowly and steadily emerges. It's almost like the author of Mark, with this curious ending, is saying to the reader, you know, hey you, Jesus isn't really dead. He's alive and he's bringing good news into the world. Even if things look really bad right now, Keep going. The story isn't over. Stick together. Keep moving. Fortunately, the women and the early church stuck together and kept moving. The Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler was written back in 1993, almost 30 years ago. This sci-fi novel focuses on a teenage girl living in California after a time of environmental destruction and corporate greed, leaving the country in a time of chaos and violence. It's on many pandemic reading lists, and I picked it up a couple weeks ago. It's a a dark and disturbing novel. It's not for the faint of heart, be warned. Um, But even though there's chaos and sadness and tragedy in this book, there's hope as well. I don't want to give away the story, but I can say that this young woman despite all the pain and suffering in her life, has a sense of hope. And that hope drives her on a journey. And she begins the journey, and she meets other people on the journey, and together they keep moving forward. And in a way, this whole novel affirms the gospel message of Mark chapter 16, of our gospel reading for today, looking at the women at the tomb who came together and out of their fear journeyed together in hope. Stick together, keep going, trust that things will get better. This is the journey of faith. This is the journey of Easter. I'm really glad to be part of a church where we talk regularly about the journey of faith. It's right there in our mission statement and the language runs through the church. Our newsletter is called The Caravan and The Caravan is a group of people traveling together in sometimes scary and difficult times, but sticking together and supporting one another on the journey. And I'm glad to be part of a church where we encourage one another on that journey. We shared little Easter boxes with um, members and friends of the church. And in those Easter boxes, there was a little hope stone that everybody everybody got. I've been carrying mine around with me um, over the past week or so. And many times I hold it like a prayer bead. And it helps me remember that God is with us and that we have reason to hope. Maybe you need that stone to remind you that God's love is strong enough to roll away the stones in your life, to offer forgiveness and new life. Maybe you need that stone to remember that the worst thing is never the last thing. Maybe you need that stone to know that God is with you always, no matter what. Or maybe there's someone in your life who you can give your stone to. Maybe somebody in your life really needs some hope and you can offer that hope by giving them a stone and encouraging and supporting them on the journey. We have some extra stones in the church office. Contact us if you'd like one. On that first Easter, the women went to the tomb with uncertainty and isolation and fear. They had an encounter at that tomb. The the stone was rolled away. There was an angelic figure there with a message for them. And that experience at the tomb gave those women hope that things would get better. It gave them hope that they weren't alone. 
It gave them hope that the worst thing isn't the last thing. And it gave them hope to live with a new sense of purpose. And it gave them hope to share with the world. Thanks be to God. Happy Easter. Amen. This is a time of offering where we remember that we have been blessed in order to bless that God calls us to use our time, our talents, our resources, the things that we have been blessed with in order to extend that love, extend that joy, extend a vision of hope to others too. And so during this time of offering, you're invited to reflect on the ways that you might give. If you'd like to give financially to Covenant Presbyterian Church, you can do so by mail or online. And however you give, however you offer of yourself, offer a blessing, may you do so with a vision of hope, a vision of connection, a vision of Easter. May it be so.
the people of the resurrection. As we celebrate today the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the promise of life, God's victory, we remember Jesus' call to pray, to pray for one another and to pray without ceasing. We have a prayer list here at Covenant, a list of names of folks who have asked us to pray for them. And so we lift these names up in prayer. For Roseanne Jacks, the mother of Lisa Cantrell and the grandmother of Mara Cantrell. For Andy Eikenberry, the son of Barb and Eric Eikenberry. For Judy Vandy Sandy, the mother of Matt Vandy Sandy. And for Jim Carper, the brother of Jan Swartz. We hold them in our prayers, hold them close to our heart, because it is our gift to pray for and with one another. We come now to the table, to a time of sharing a meal, a joyful feast instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ. When he was at the table with his disciples, he invited them to eat with him. And so we are invited to this table, this table that is not my table or covenant's table. And whatever table you are with, it is no longer your own. But it belongs in that upper room with Christ and his disciples. This is the table of the joyful feast. Let us pray. God of life, your resurrection reminds us of the life abundant that you promised to us. As we look with wonder at your creation, how then can we doubt that life is the final answer? You created this world in wonder and majesty. The cycles of the season recall the resurrection that we celebrate today. We give thanks for the reminder to see this resurrection as we watch the budding trees and the blooming flowers. We give thanks for the covenant history come into fulfillment in the resurrection of your Son, a history to which we are heirs and a resurrection from which we benefit. From Jesse's line there arose a king, a messiah. Throughout all of history you revealed yourself to be a liberator, delivering the Israelites from slavery, delivering your people from oppression, declaring good news to the poor, and ultimately liberating us from the very bonds of death itself. This is good news for all creation, for all children of God, even when we deny you, even when we turn from you and commit ourselves to ways of sin, even when we commit ourselves to the ways of death, you are faithful to us still, calling us to your kingdom, to your arms, to your resurrection, to your promise. You came to earth and showed us the way of your kingdom. You showed us the justice that you proclaim, release to the prisoner, comfort to the afflicted, challenge to earthly powers. In your life, you sided against the oppressors and worked alongside the oppressed. You spoke truth to power and pursued justice in all you did. You gave us a path to walk and empowered us, your disciples, to help one another. We remember your death hung up on a cross, displayed for the world to see, mocked and beaten, but not defeated killed unjustly because humanity's sinful nature could not abide such goodness. But your word triumphed. Your resurrection showed us your love for all of us. And now we see the resurrection around us in the promise of new life eternal and in the life that we live transformed here on earth. We give thanks that on the night of his arrest, shortly before the miracle of the resurrection, Jesus was seated at the table with his friends, and he took the bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. 
and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Friends, this is the bread of life. Take, eat, the body of Christ. In the same way, he took the cup, and having given thanks, he blessed it, saying, This cup is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you eat of this bread and do drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, this is the cup of the new covenant. Drink. The joyful feast of the people of God served for you, transformed by God's Spirit. Let us pray. Holy and wonderful God, in this meal we partake of your body and blood, the bread and cup transformed by your spirit to nourish our souls. This feast is a joyful celebration of the life eternal, glimpsed in the resurrection brought to fulfillment by your love and mercy. So as nourished people, may we be strong to witness to the power of your love, life, justice, and mercy to all whom you have called blessed. Amen. Friends, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The journey continues for us. We move from fear to hope together, welcoming the love God has for us 
and the world. Now may the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us this day, this season, and always. Alleluia. Amen.